Okay, I think that's probably long enough for most people to have joined who want to come. So welcome everybody to Plant Life's Making Space for Species, uh, a series of webinars uh, in these free interaction plant life series. Um, first of all, let me tell you that this session is being recorded and indeed will be available to watch at a later date, probably next week uh, on YouTube. And indeed there will be a link in the chat later if you want to pursue that. Um, if you have any questions, which hopefully you will, uh, we'd love you to uh, put them to us, but please do so in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. It should, it's on the bottom of my screen, so hopefully it'll be somewhere on your screen, rather than in the chat. The chat is there for technical issues, really. Uh, so if you do have any technical problems, um, our lovely Becky will attempt to sort them out for you if you put them in the chat. Um, but any questions about the presentations that you're going to see, please put them in the Q&A. So welcome to Making Space for Species. This is a strand that we've developed for um, species conservation. Uh, we've already had uh, an introductory talk on this a couple of weeks ago, which sort of set, set out the case for single species conservation. And broadly, what that focuses on is the fact that we tend to prioritize rare and threatened species for conservation action. And one of the reasons why this is actually an effective means of conservation is because they are the first to suffer from the degradation of habitats and landscapes. And so therefore efforts to conserve them often have a great many spin-off benefits for other things which, also, which share those habitats and landscapes. So they're good standard bearers for a whole variety of things. And hopefully these things will come up in the talks. Um, and a big theme I feel that's going to appear is one of partnership because inevitably there are lots of interests uh, associated with the conservation of any habitat or landscape. And we could only uh, achieve these things through talking and working with our partners who take care of other taxonomic groups, um, but also landowners and site managers and local authorities and uh, all, all the other organizations that, that, that can be involved. So we're going to uh, start off with um, Kath Shellswell, who is a botanical expert with a focus on arable and grassland plants. Uh, she can be found through the summer in the fields and hills across Wales and southwest England diligently recording wild plants, according to my blurb. Um, Kath will correct you or not, no doubt. And uh, tell us what you're going to talk about, Kath. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> well, most of the time I did actually uh, trying to record plants. Um, but I want to tell you today about saving pheasant's eye. Uh, so pheasant's eye is actually a very glamorous plant, very handsome, uh, and as you can see here it's a member of the buttercup family and we have been spending quite a bit of time looking at that, this particular species because it's on the brink of extinction in this country and um, we clearly don't want it to go extinct and uh, trying to work out how we can actually save it. So I wanted to take you through the story of pheasant's eye and what we knew before and what we know now after spending some time really researching it. So what do we know before? We know that it is a plant of arable uh, cereal fields, usually now found in the margins or corners of regularly disturbed areas. It can be in regularly disturbed grassland, but in, this, in the UK, it's almost exclusively found in cereal margins. Um, it likes calcareous soils, particularly chalk soils, uh, but will also grow on calcareous clay soils. And there's a pros and cons to that for, for this species. It's autumn germinating, uh, and uh, we believed it flowered in June and July. It can germinate in the spring. Plants tend to be smaller uh, with fewer flowers if they are spring germinating compared to the autumn germinating ones. And it has large, heavy seeds 
And this is why it normally was found and is found in cereal fields because the seeds were spread in the grain crops that were sown. It is endangered. And there's, we think, approximately 30 populations. And as you can see from the map, they're scattered across the UK. But do take this uh, with a little bit of a pinch of salt uh, because we know that some of these are reintroductions and, they and it was never actually necessarily originally found in those areas. But as you can see, it has remarkably declined since 2000, uh, even so. And the reasons for that decline um, over you know, a period of time are better seed cleaning, where we've been able to, to remove um, weed or uh, arable plants uh, seed from cereal crops so that it's not sown with the grain again. Um, greater competition for space and nutrients with the cereal crops and more competitive weeds because we have developed our cereals um, and the varieties that we use so that they are better at taking up nutrients and they grow quicker and they tiller more which means that the you know the, the cereals which are members of the grass family send up more flowering spikes. We also fertilise the land, so there's higher soil nutrients which um, increase the number of competitive weeds. We've used widespread, um, we've had widespread use of broad spectrum herbicides and going back to something to do with the biology of the plant, low seed production. So we knew quite a bit about it, not all of this may necessarily be correct which I'll be coming on to, um, but we also had some gaps in the ecology uh, and the biggest gap was to do with the seed biology and reproduction. And we really uh, didn't know much about that and some of the mechanisms involved there. We also need to look at flowering time and seasonality. So as Tim said, I've been working on our plants now for quite a long time. At the beginning when we started to look at pheasant's eye, which was 2018, I'd been working on plants for about 10 years. I'd never seen pheasant's eye. Uh, so what's what's gone wrong there i mean it's it's very scarce in the landscape but i've been to places with pheasant sign and hadn't seen it um we also wanted to look at the management of populations which are already out there and think about the restoration and reintroduction of populations um uh, so that we can bring this species back and then we've got two overarching issues as well climate change and genetic diversity uh, particularly now that the population is becoming more isolated. In 2018, we started taking part in a national, well, England-wide project, I should say, um, uh, for looking at um, England's most threatened species and trying to save them from extinction. And this was led by Natural England, along with a variety of um, environmental NGOs like Plant Life uh, and Bug Life and um, the RSPB. The aim was to save 20 species from extinction and benefit over 200 more, which Pheasant Sai falls into. And it was funded by the Heritage um, Lottery Fund. And we also got a little bit of money as well from People's Postcode Lottery. So thank you very much to them. Um, and as Tim said at the beginning, we can't do anything alone. You know, this is partnership because we need that partnership and the different skills that different people and different um, organisations can bring to this to actually help us discover so, some of the uh, intricacies to do with the ecology of the species. So on this project, uh, Plant Life and the RSPB teamed up with Kew Gardens uh, and we also worked with farmers and landowners on pheasant side in particular across the country, mostly in the Hampshire area with Wessex Farm Wildlife. Uh, and also in the Norfolk area as well. And we used one of uh, plant life reserves um, uh, in um, Kent. So I'm going to crack on talking about the biology because that's all why we're all here really. And the first thing we needed to bottom out was the seed biology. And this is where Q uh, were absolutely amazing because they spent a lot of time looking at the dormancy process of that seed. So dormancy is a survival strategy. You don't want all your seeds to develop every single year. And because pheasant size is an annual um, plant, it needs to complete its life cycle within a year. So it needs to hold some seed back. And to do that, there's different types of dormancy that plants have developed. 
And actually, it's quite tricky for pheasant side because it's got two types. Um, morphological uh, dormancy, which is where, in this case, the embryos are immature at the point that they're shed from the plant. And they need heat to mature. So they need a summer's worth of heat to mature, which is quite an interesting thing if you think about it. So they need to be somewhere warm. We can go into all the jokes about Bake Off because that usually starts in the summer, but it really does is a requirement and, and, and it's something to think about when we want to reintroduce and look at where populations are. The other uh, type of dormancy it has is physiological dormancy, which is a thick, hard seed coat that actually stops the root, the radical, from penetrating until it naturally splits or decays. Now we say natural and that's through repeated warm and dry cycles, but it could also be scuffing through cultivation. And this is where mechanical management may come into its own as well to actually encourage that seed to break its dormancy. We didn't know this before 2019, but we need to know it to think about the mechanisms that we can use in the conservation of the species. We also need to know about reproduction. Uh, so I said it's large, heavy seeds, and this is a seed head with in, you know, unripe seeds, so still on it. Um, and when Q grew this plant in controlled conditions, uh, they found that on average there are 259 seeds per plant, which is a huge number, but these are really controlled conditions where, where, you know, where the seeds get care and attention. So water, they get weeding around them, um, and uh, they're also grown in very good soil as well. So although that soil might be calcareous, it's going to contain quite a lot of nutrients. It's not going to have the competition from other plants. So we needed to know what happened in the wild. And we looked at a, a couple of plots on Ranscombe Farm, which is a plant life uh, farm in Kent, um, on two slightly different types of soil down there. So one was shallow chalk soil and the other was deeper calcareous soil. And the results were actually quite interesting. On the shallow chalk soil, which is where we tend to find pheasant sai, there were lots and lots of plants that grew from the seed that was sown, but they were all quite small and they had, you know, fewer than one and a half flowers per plant. And they produced not that many seeds, you know, just over 17. So although there were lots of plants, actually the return rate was quite low. However, on the deeper calcareous soils, which are slightly richer in nutrients, there were over 200 seeds per plant and that came from about an average of nine flowers per plant so the plants do much better but there are only two plants in that area and that's possibly to do with competition from other plants that grow on that type of soil and they're just that much better at getting away and then they shade out um, pheasant side which isn't very competitive. Management is a really key thing for us to look at. And, you know, as I said, I've never seen pheasant's eye before 2019. And that's because actually I was going out at the wrong time of year without realizing it. So most of the time that we go and look for arable plants, unless we know that they're um, early flowering, um, is usually June and July. Uh, May, we don't tend to go out and look for them because we imagine that most of the things haven't actually um, developed far enough along the line to be able to find them. But the key flowering period for pheasant sai is actually May. And we found um, plants in flower on the 2nd of May in actually relatively cool conditions. And it will flower further on. And that's partly because it's an autumn germinating species. Spring germinating pheasant sai plants will flower slightly later towards the end of June and beginning of July but they also need to get away and, and drop their seed so that the seeds can mature in the heat. Without, that, without it maturing, it won't then develop the following year. And we also need to think about cultivation as well. So because that seed needs to be on the soil surface, those areas need to be left over the summer to allow the heat to do its magic and that, seed, that embryo to develop. So the, you know, the earliest to cultivate is really in the autumn. And because autumn plants tend to be bigger and bushier than spring um, germinating um, plants, um, it's best to do it at that time of year. But it also means that we need to look at the method of cultivation as well. And we did start to find that 
areas that were minimum tilled, so that's a very shallow uh, type of cultivation where it didn't remove a lot of the, um, uh, the grasses and the vegetation that can grow up, um, actually meant that there were fewer pheasant's eye plants. So it really is uncompetitive. And we saw that when we looked at the amount of bare ground around uh, individual plants, which needs to be around about a third of the area within half a meter radius of a plant. We, you know, unsurprisingly found that the pH of soil where the plants were growing was 8 to 8.2, so very calcareous, and that it would, of course, grow on sandy silt loams and clay loams. I think we knew that already. Um, the surprise was that actually it can grow in moderate, moderately fertile conditions, as long as that doesn't uh, increase the other vegetation, particularly the problem plants that can grow up around it and shade it out. There's one other bit of... Um, uh, useful information that we needed to take on board and that was that flower over the last 20 years um, up to 2015 the um, flower size of pheasant size seems to be increasing and this was found uh, in a study by Tom in, in 2015 larger flowers seem to attract more insect pollinators but the catch is that the larger flowers had a shorter flowering period as well so how that affects pheasant size we don't know yet and we also don't know how that will play out with climate change. So reintroduction is a, a last ditch method to try and bring this um, species back. And we need to look at how to create the conditions naturally so that seed would mature and break dormancy and grow. But also we need to think about the alternative as well and how we can prompt this along because of that really complex seed dormancy uh, mechanisms. So for, on three sites, we sowed uh, the untreated seed um, in 2019 and uh, we sowed it at, uh, towards the middle of July, beginning of August and end of August to see what would happen at those sites. Um, and unsurprisingly, uh, because we knew about the dormancy mechanisms at that point in time, the July uh, sown population all germinated. Uh, not all the seed, clearly, because there's dormancy, but they all had some plants there. There were a few at, um, of the plots that were uh, sown with the early August um, uh, seed uh, that had plants, but not all of them. And none of the um, plots sown with seed at the end of August germinated that autumn, uh, and in fact haven't germinated since either. So that's told us that if we want to do this naturally, we need to sow the seed early enough so that it can mature and that there's time to break the dormancy um, of, of the plots, uh, of the seed, so that in, in the plots where we're spreading it to. The problem with sowing seed in July is that sometimes the kit isn't there, but also those plots develop quite a high uh, cover of green um, material by the time it comes to flowering next spring. And that can inhibit the pheasant side growth. So again, we talked with Q, uh, and we also worked with um, Wessex Farm Wildlife in Hampshire to really look at this issue uh, with um, four farms there to see whether we could artificially mature and grow the, um, the seed in a real life situation. So artificial seed, uh, uh, maturation is um, really using um, ovens uh, and uh, to um, ripen the seed. So Q put the seed into their ovens at 60% relative humidity for two weeks. Then they did a follow-up warm stratification on damp sand at 30 centigrade, centigrade for another two weeks. And then the final thing was to break that seed coat. So they did a heat shock drying treatment at 40 centigrade uh, at 60% humidity and then they sent us the seed. We managed to get that seed out towards the end of August which would be the normal time that a farmer land manager would go out and cultivate their fields. They would start in August and it would carry on into September. We did it at the beginning of that kind of annual uh, management cycle because we wanted any uh, leftover warmth to try and um, mature the seed. Uh, unfortunately, this was 2019. And if you can remember back then, uh, it started raining 
in mid-September and it didn't stop until the beginning of March 2020. Um, so we didn't have that much warmth. Um, but on the four farms that we spread it on in Hampshire, all of them had pheasants either the following year. And that's brilliant, you know, is a fantastic result because we've actually been able to get it to mature. Now, it's, it's an interesting case because some of them had uh, just a couple of plants. I think the most we had was around about 10 plants on one of the plots. Um, but the following year, in 2021, 20, um, we had over 200 plants on the plots, as you can see here, and they were really big. Again, this is clay soils. So it really does help to develop that seed resource and that seed bank. And that's what the dormancy mechanism is also doing. We have replicated this um, experiment, trying it at some farms in Norfolk as well, um, uh, to make sure that it wasn't just a one hit wonder. And it's also been successful on the two farms that we did over there. So thanks to the partnership, we've been able to figure out how to get pheasant side back but we still have some gaps in our knowledge. So I've already touched on some things to do with climate change, but we've got to think that with anticipated um, change in our climate, is pheasant sigh actually gonna be a winner from this? We expect in the climate to warm, and this plant needs um, warmth to mature its seed. So, you know, maybe actually it's on to winner and we could see an increase in, in um, this plant if the seed is spread. Uh, but we would still want to think about where we're putting the seed probably on um, south facing aspects uh, and clearly on chalk and calcare soil and in areas where the sites are going to be cultivated rather than min tilled, so ploughed rather than min tilled. The one thing that we haven't really been able to look at so far is to do a genetic diversity and variation. Here I'm going to skip onto one of the other species that the Colour and Margins project looked at. So we looked at 10 arable plants and three ground beetles, and that's um, uh, red hemp nettle. And we were very lucky we managed to, to draw together some funding to look at the genetic diversity um, and variation of that particular species because we noticed some differences in certain populations. Um, we're still awaiting the results of that, uh, but the preliminary analysis suggests that there is an east and a west genetic uh, variation between um, the populations of red hemp nettle across the country and uh, the west, western populations seem to be slightly more genetically diverse. Well, pheasant sigh is going through a bit of a crunch period and um, the uh, populations um, are very isolated. So what, what, how and what is that doing to the genetics of this particular species? So it really is a whirlwind of pheasant sigh information that I've thrown at you. Um, we've written all of this up into a portfolio and I believe Becky is going to put these two li links into the chat. So please go and download that. Um, if you want any of the other species portfolios, we're also going to bung that in, scroll down to the yellow download bar and you can download uh, all of the documents there. They're, they are technical documents about how to save those species. Um, and a massive thank you to all of the partners. Uh, hopefully some are here watching this, <laughs> um, uh, but we couldn't have done it without them. Brilliant. Thank you, Kath. That's super. Uh, just a note to... Uh... Uh, listeners, watchers, um, viewers, um, we are getting some Q&A, some questions coming in and so far I'm going to save them for the end. So uh, I apologise if you're not getting anything, but uh, yes, and if I could just remind people, if you have a question about the uh, talks, please put it in the Q&A rather than the chat um, and then we'll pick them up. So we'll have some questions right at the end, uh, but we'll move swiftly on to Dave Lammercraft, who is um, Plant Life's Lichen and Bryophyte Specialist from England, Wales. And he's going to be talking about the, uh, the horsehair lichen. Over to you, Dave. Okay, hi. So, yeah, I'm Dave. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, a horsehair lichen, Briaria smithii. Um, so, this is a lichen here on the right hand side. So, it's what we call uh, a fruticose lichen, a shrubby or bushy lichen. Bit like the beard lichens, as it is. Uh, the map on the left is its distribution in Britain and Ireland. See the um, 
Uh, these are 10 kilometer squares occupied by the species and you see the pale green ones a couple up in Scotland there. Um, they're records from pre-1959. The blue squares are records from 1960 to 1999 and the red square, the single one down there in, in uh, Devon, uh, is a post-2000 record. So you can basically see that it, it's been lost uh, from a couple of sites in Scotland, lost from Wales and now it's just found in um, Dartmoor in Devon. And it's found here in two sites, uh, Blackatall Copse up near Oakhampton on the northwest edge of the moor and then Westman's Wood uh, near two bridges down in the middle of the moor. Uh, both similar looking, um, you know, these stunted dwarf oak woods, um, quite high altitude, dark moor, part of our temperate rainforest. This is the global distribution of Bronaria smithii. Uh, you can see it's a pretty rare thing. Um, in Europe, it's mostly uh, kind of in the temperate rainforest zone in southern Scandinavia, southern Norway, Sweden, um, and Western Britain, down there in northwest Spain. And then there's a scatter of records through Central Europe and Middle East and to Southeast Asia, uh, Papua New Guinea, Japan, and Hawaii. So quite a strange distribution, a little bit tropical, a bit subtropical, and then with these temperate rainforest um, areas too. So what are we doing about it? Well, uh, back in 2003, Brian and Sandy Coppins, um, really well-respected uh, lichenologists, undertook some uh, baseline monitoring. They basically set up some um, monitoring plots for Briorias, uh, the Briorias smithii and other rare species at Wisconsin with Amblacator cops. Um, they repeated that from Natural England in 2010, and then we got funding to repeat that um, again in 2016-27, again funding from Natural England from their Species Recovery Programme. Um, so when you're monitoring and surveying for the Briorias, um, the first problem you get is you have to identify Briorias smithii amongst the commoner Briorias bicolor. So Briorias bicolor is on the left here and smithii on the right. Um, they have a slightly different look about them. Um, smithy eyes a bit more rangy, a bit more spread out and by colour often a bit more compact but they do overlap a lot and it's quite confusing. Um, this is a photo through a hand lens and you really need to focus in on some of the details on to look for smithy eyes to tell it apart from by colour. There's little clusters of tiny little spiky bits. Um, they're vegetative reproductive propagules um, but that's what can set apart from the commoner Briorias species. Um, but really the definitive way to do it is with a, a special chemical test. Um, so it's quite involved just, just surveying for this species. Um, it's also quite a challenge trying to relocate the monitoring plots uh, that Brian and Sandy established back in 2003. Uh, getting the general area is straightforward enough because there are grid references with taking the GPS is not straightforward enough, but um, Actually finding the right boulders and the right trees takes a little bit of work to, to look at the old photos and try and work out what you're looking at now. Um, and obviously things change in woodlands quite dramatically in some cases. Um, so once you found the right rocks, um, it's a matter of um, trying to find the Briorea. So these little white tags mark all the little tufts of Briorea growing amongst the mosses there. Um, and then you, once you've found your tufts, you have to try and work out what species it is. Um, so what have you found out? Well, uh, basically, uh, these are the kind of monitoring results over um, those three monitoring points, so from 2003 through to 2016-17. And looking at Smithia, you can see it was pretty rare in 2003, just six tufts um, found on four trees or boulders. By 2010, a bit more of it was found. Um, 2016, I didn't find very much of it, but found quite a bit in 2017. It's interesting when you um, look at the 2016-17 totals combined, it's pretty much the same, well, exactly the same results as there was in 2010. Um, but the detail is quite different. So I didn't find it in places where Brian and Sandy have found it. Um, I did find it in new places where they hadn't found it. So um, what this is telling us really is that one, it's still present, which is a really good sign. Um, 
it seems to be more widespread. It's perhaps more common, um, a bit more of it on the site than we perhaps realised. And it seems to be going through its kind of population cycles. It seems to be reproducing. Um, you can see the numbers for Briar and Bicolor there. Uh, they kind of go up and down, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, and then Briar, Briaria fusescens, the third Briaria that's set back to the crops, um, was thought to have become extinct, um, but a couple of tiny little tufts appeared on the boulder come 2017. Um, and another thing we've discovered is that it's the Briaria species generally are really tied in with this kind of community of bryophytes, so liverworts like Scopania gracilis and mosses like Lycrane and Scaparian, um, and other lichen species like the coral lichens, the Sauroporus globosus that you can see here, the one that looks like coral, uh, Cladonia species, the Sleuth link lichen, Hypochicana levigator, and the big one at the bottom is um, the speckled sea storm lichen, Citrinia oliveterum. So it's really tied in with this kind of community. Um, and same kind of community on the trees, um, but with the addition of Usnea species. So there's a lot of witch's whiskers, Usnea florida, and a string of sausages like an Usnea articulata uh, growing with brioreas on, on these trees. And, and this community really seems to like these horizontal, near horizontal, gently um, inclined um, tree limbs. Um, we've also discovered that. Um, there's this kind of succession, this cycle uh, with these communities on the rocks um, and that this can actually um, happen in quite a short space of time. So within the lifetime of this monitoring program, so since 2003, this, this cycle will complete itself. So you can start off with bare rock and you get colonization by smaller bryophytes like Dicranium and Scopania. Then you start to get um, the larger bryophytes coming in, like Isothecium, the mouse tail moss, and Antidiodolphus laureus, the little shaggy moss, and they become dominant. And um, but ultimately, they uh, they become too dominant in a way, so they become big, and they fall off, they get knocked off, and then you end up with bare rock again, and that cycle starts over. Um, this is kind of what it looks like pictorially, uh, from bare rock on the left to bare rock on the right. Um, and the Briorias come in in this kind of early-ish stage of the of that of that process. So once the bare rock is starting to be colonised by Scopania and Dicrane, and that's when you seem to get the Briorias coming in, and then they'll start to decline as the big mosses um, start to become more dominant. So with that middle picture there and the onwards to the right, that's when you start to lose the the Briorias. So it's kind of like cyclical. So that might explain why the Briaria bicolor population started relatively high and went down and then just come back up again. Um, we've also tried some translocation with the Briaria. Um, I found some Briaria smithii on a dead uh, tree limb, so I took that opportunity to try transplanting it onto uh, a live limb of the same tree. Um, these orange squiggles mark where the lichen is, and um, you can see on the left there that I took a small strand of Briaria and um, attached it to a, a limb with um, some plastic garden mesh stapled onto the uh, onto the tree branch. Um, and then that's it three years later in 2020. You can see it spread. Um, it seems pretty happy. You also see on this photo that, that dynamism I've just been talking about with the boulders. You get it on the trees too. So you can see that bare area of bark to the right. Um, that's obviously that big clump of scopania that's fallen off from the left-hand photo. And then the bare area that you can see on the left-hand photo has been filled by 2020 by scopania. So you get this kind of dynamism happening. And the Briaria's really like, seem to really like growing in amongst the Dicranium and the scopania. I did try another technique as well with the transplant. So this was just, um, I just threaded some strands of Briaria into the mosses, um, trying to kind of replicate what would happen naturally. And that also worked. Um, you can see on the right here that that's, that's grown and spread um, within those three years. Um, overall with the transplants, it was about 50%, maybe slightly over 50% success rate. And the mesh method worked a bit better than this method, but 
both works okay, you know, both have good potential, I think, uh, should we need to go down that route at some stage in the future. Um, then looking at Whistons Wood, so we've not done any detailed monitoring really at Whistons Wood. Um, Briaris smithii was thought to have become extinct at Whistons Wood, um, but it hadn't been seen for several decades anyway. But then Professor David Hawksworth was there with Paul Cannon from Q um, a couple of years ago. So David Hawksworth found this originally here uh, back in the early 1970s, and he refound it in the same area where he found it back then. Uh, in 2020, so that's back um, or still at Western Wood. And last year I was doing a little bit of monitoring work helping out Natural England and we did find more of it on trees and rocks, so so that's all really encouraging. Um, it's, it's still really rare though, so um, I'd, I'd always said that, um, so based on the work at Blackator Cops, this is before it was really found that Whispers word, I'd always say that the, the British population would fit on the side of an A4 piece of paper. I think now with the Whispers Wood um, discoveries, I think I might go as far as to say on a side and a half of A4 paper. So even though the numbers are kind of okay and it's holding its own, it's still incredibly rare. Um, so, so it's still pretty vulnerable. Um, so from the monitoring work that we did last year, um, this is an area near the uh, near where people enter into the wood. If you're if you're going to visit Whistons Wood, this is probably the area where you kind of end up. Um, so on the left hand photo, you, that's 2003, then 2010 in the middle, and 2021 um, to the right. You can see the white tags on the left hand photo marking Briaria that have been lost by 2010. You can see there has been some change in the bryophyte cover. Um, basically an increase in isothecium, um, which is probably what's led to the demise of the Briaria. But you can see a big change uh, when you get to 2021, particularly in the amount of bare rock you can see. Um, and what seems to be happening, it's early days and this is kind of a hunch, we need to look into this a bit more, but what seems to be happening here is that the visitor pressure, and there's been a significant amount of visitor pressure in the last couple of years, is kind of um, interrupting those natural dynamics of, of the bryophytes and the lichens. You seem to be, we seem to be missing the, um, the community that, that supports the Briaria, and we either have bare rock or we have isothecium and, and the common mosses. So um, you can see what's happening here. There's a visitor there sat on the rock, and I think that's basically what's happening that people are sitting on the rocks. Um, the things like the isothecium, they're a bit more resistant to. Um, getting knocked off and brushed off, whereas these cushions of, of final mosses, you know, I think they're more susceptible to getting knocked off. So, like I say, we need to look into this a bit more, and this is this is kind of my feeling that, about what's going on here at the moment. But either way, there's there's basically no Briaria left in that area now. So, either way, there's something going on uh, that we need to understand a bit more. Um, now, aside from this kind of detailed stuff we've been doing on the sites, we know that uh, Briaria species, all of them, are really sensitive to nitrogen deposition, um, so ammonia in particular. Um, and uh, this is a map of ammonia deposition across the southwest, with the red being the higher levels and the dark blues, purpley colour, being the lower levels. So you can see that levels are relatively low on Dartmoor, but then it's surrounded by pretty high levels of of ammonia deposition, and this is, um, in this instance, largely agricultural derived. Um, at Blackator Cops, we are seeing signs of nitrogen deposition from looking at the lichens. Uh, so the lichens are really good at telling us what's going on with the air quality. Not necessarily seeing the impact there on the Briora directly, but it's there's certainly um, nitrogen deposition, ammonia deposition at Blackator Cops. Mm. Um, Certainly wouldn't want to get it, wouldn't want to kind of get it, uh, wouldn't want it to get much worse than it is now for sure. And uh, this is something we really need to keep an eye on. Um, we also know that the Briaria needs these sort of open, well lit conditions. Um, uh, it does seem to like a, a canopy, a wooden canopy, it doesn't really get far outside the wood. But this is the grazing exposure in Westerners Wood um, on the left of the fence here. You can kind of see uh, this is up the side of the fence here is is a, a regularly used path by people, so it looks a little bit um, 
uh, affected by visitors. But um, to the left, you can see the impact that removed and grazing has had on the wood. And if we've removed grazing from the whole wood, then uh, we probably would have lost all of our area interest. Uh, because the, the brambles, the wood rush, and the ferns just smother um, all the boulders on the wooden floor. So uh, the bryoria and all these bryophytes just wouldn't survive. The trees are also affected by ivy and honeysuckle and bramble. So, um, you know, it's not great uh, at all for the bryoria species. Um, like I say, we probably have lost them if the whole wood had gone that way. Um, that's often done due to concerns about a lack of regeneration and linked to grazing. Um, however, this is Blackator cops, um, which is grazed by sheep and ponies and cattle. Um, yet there's you know, abundant regeneration there, whether it's little seedlings coming through the bottom left or older saplings like uh, top left. And then you get areas where you get almost like a swarm of young oaks. And um, these are popping up through the, the boulder screen. And a lot of this is also, I think, uh, phoenix regeneration. So uh, sprouting from fallen trees and that kind of thing. So, you know, there, there's there's actually plenty of regeneration happening. And it struck me when I was putting the slide together earlier on that there's a theme across these photos, and that's sunlight. Um, and that's often overlooked as being, you know, really important for oak regeneration, um, which you didn't, you don't really have in that um, grazing exposure in Western's wood. Uh, in fact, there's very little regen in that grazing exposure at all. So. Um, yeah, so so changes in the management basically can really impact on on the bryoria species. Okay, so what next? So uh, we're hoping we're going to get some funding to look into what's happening at Westlands Wood in a bit more detail to try and tease out some of those issues that um, seem to be emerging. Um, and you know, so hopefully by this time next year we'll have we'll learned a little bit more. Okay, so thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave. Um, we do have some particular questions about your talk, um, which you might. Uh, so for the end, if you could possibly prime yourself to show the slide with the mixed moss community, i.e. before it all falls off the rock uh, for later, somebody's interested to see that again. And we'll move very swiftly on to Joe Jones, who is our Rex Conservation Officer with Plant Life is going to be talking about prostrate perennial law. Thank you, Tim. Can you see that? Yes. Excellent. So we've got one of. Oh, the hold, oh hold on a mo. Hold on a mo. I think Dave needs to stop sharing. I should have cut him out. I think. What well, we've got the end slide and not the beginning slide. Can you stop sharing, Dave? Can you hear me, Dave? No answer from Dave. Oh, there we are. There you go. You're on, Joe. Yeah, can you see? Perennial norwell. So this is one of the rarest plants in the world. And um, it has this glorious name, Sloranthus perennis, subspecies prostratus, easily remembered because to see it, you, you, you can lie down to look at it closely. Um, a tiny jewel of a plant, uh, when the sun shines on it and it's, it's white sort of glows, it's a tiny, tiny little carpet of a plant. It's only found in the Brex, which is where I work, in the UK, and that's in the whole of the world. And within the Brex, it only survives at three native sites, i.e. where it's always grown, and then it's been reintroduced or introduced to three other sites. So that makes a total of six sites for a plant that only grows in the UK, in the world. To give the context of the Brex, it's somewhere between Cambridge and Norwich on the borders of Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, well known now for its agriculture. Um, it's, it's got amazing geology and uh, this geology was shown in its 
brilliantly when this area was deep ploughed and we had the good fortune to have the use of a drone when Natural England were doing some drone photography and they flew it over here. And this shows what's known as Breck stripes, where you can have chalk adjacent to sand. And this is all to do with the glaciers that moved across here. You've got chalk bedrock and then the glacial material came across on the top and you're, you're left with this kind of thing. So as a result, you have plants, quite a few species that are only found in the Brex, that are only found here in the UK. Um, but the one we're looking at today of all these fabulous Brex specialities is the one bottom right on the screen at the moment, which is perennial normal. The Brex has had a lot of impact over the last century. People looked at the soil, it looked very poor, um, it, the Brex name came from it being used for agriculture only occasionally. People would graze the sheep on it, break it up for a year, then have to leave it because it would have lost its nutrients and wouldn't grow anything, hence the Brex. Then, um, so it looked like poor, not much good land. It's a great place to turn into a, a forestry when the country was in need of timber. So we, a large area of the heathland was lost. A lot was covered with forestry. Then with the introduction of nitrogen, nutrients and um, artificial fertilizers and the ability to irrigate, um, large areas um, were turned over to um, cropping, particularly vegetables, good, good high income crop. And, um, and of course, um, housing. So the bottom right corner is, is where there was an arable field with a very rare Veronica all over. And this is the tiny strip left, this bank that's now laid out by trees. Um, the habitat was quite a lot of it was uh, created by rabbits. Rabbits kept it in check and, and grazed it very hard. Um, they were brought by the Normans. And um, one of the things that's happened recently is that they have died in vast numbers of viral hemorrhagic disease number two um, and as a result a lot of coarse vegetation has been taking over taking over that's the sort of stuff that we can see um, there are also invisible pressures that both kath and dave have already mentioned climate change nitrogen deposition well loss of rabbits um, we see the effects of there's also a loss of processes that enables these plants to survive and perhaps to spread um, it's the area there were inland dunes, a lot of blown sand, um, plants would have been buried by sand, seeds might have been blown, um, blown around, um, and so on. So we've there's been a lot of kind of uh, fencing also has stopped those natural processes occurring across what used to be very large areas of heathland that people used to describe as like crossing the Sahara. So, like Kath worked with uh, Pheasant's Eye, um, through the Back from the Brink project, uh, Perennial Norwell was one of the focuses of that project and gave us the chance to really do some more work on trying to understand what was going on with this incredibly rare species. Um, it's very difficult to get funding to do the kind of research to understand what is going on with species. Because in like so many other things in this world, what is wanted is rapid delivery of results and something to show people that you've, you've got change. And it takes a bit to sit back and think and understand what's going on. We were fortunate in that there had been a reintroduction programme in the 1990s. And I got to know the botanist who was very involved with that. And she had had six plants um, from Q that Q had grown for her, ready for introductions, and they had sat on the low wall next to her gravel drive. They had seeded into her gravel drive and spread across her gravel drive. And these provided the source of our plants for our introductions when we eventually decided that was the way we were going to go and we knew where we wanted them. First of all, though, it gave us the chance. So I, dug, I went to her, her drive, made holes all over it, digging up these plants. And um, what 
Tim, I worked with Tim on this, and what we thought was this would give us a chance to grow nice, healthy, big plants that would be really ready to be introduced when we found suitable sites. Instead, a bit to our horror, quite a few of them died off. And one of the things we discovered was how useful it is to have plants on your back doorstep that you can sit and watch and understand what is happening with them. Perennial norwell is a bit of a misnomer in that this is a very short-lived perennial, if not indeed an annual, that can perinate. We also saw how it can, you can see there, how it can grow green tips at the end. Um, sometimes it gets a bit buried and then it shoots up again and so on. So we were, we were this, we knew that we were very short of sites and that makes a species very vulnerable to change and very dependent on the favoured looking after by landowners. So we wanted to try and um, spread the number of sites that it was at. And a lot of work was done to try and find suitable sites to reintroduce or introduce it to. And despite the fact that Brexit is quite a large area, this was remarkably difficult. There were masses of places that we looked at, and Tim particularly had um, led on this, but they had archaeological issues. There was unexploded ordnance. Um, we had to be sure that management would be carried on. So we wanted to turf strip back the accumulated vegetation that's grown with the lack of rabbits, with the increased nitrogen and so on, and get it back to looking a bit more brecky and sandy. Um, but you needed to know that management would carry on into the future. Interestingly, one of the places where it was introduced in the 1990s it looked absolutely fantastic at the time. Then the footpath that it was on was shut off at one end. People stopped using it and it, over, it, you know, it got overgrown. But we did manage to find um, three sites. And this is one of them, which actually has proved fantastic at the moment. So far, it looks really, really good here. And this was with thanks um, to Forestry England colleagues who suggested it. Having put in plants and carefully, you'll see how we laid them out so that we could refine them. Um, you know, the work really starts and we're very fortunate in the Brex to have the Breckland Flora Group set up by, by Plant Life, Natural England and the Forestry Commission in order to monitor the rare plants in the Brex. And they count plants and here they are at, on the left hand side is a previous introduction of perennial norwell and in fact it's the place where at the, my very first slide where somebody was lying down on their front with a photo that was taken about three years ago when there was very little heather and much more bare ground but we went back last year we count the plants to see how they're doing on the right hand side is what's happening at one of the scrapes at Santon Heath where we introduced the plants. The red triangles show where the original plants were that we put in. The blue triangles show how the plant has spread already and we're absolutely delighted to see this spread across, across the scrape and that has been mapped thanks to um, one of our Brighton Floor Group members, Julia Masson. One of the other things that we've been able to do, and this is the work of Bill Landles, Breckland Floral Group member, is he took a photograph of the plants, 20 plants, and he took a photograph every month of each one. And so we've got a kind of unique record of this period in time of a whole year plus of the plant's growth. And from this, we've got to do more work studying them yet. But you can see, we can see that plants are flowering at different times when we didn't expect them to be. Um, there's much more green, um, say in September. Originally, we said that they needed to be surveyed in July. We're learning they can be surveyed through the year and so on. So we've got a lot of things to learn about this species yet, but material to do it with. So this has taken us from a situation where we know that there have been 25 native sites for this species, of which 22 were, had been lost, leaving us with three. The reintroductions I spoke about that had been done in the 1990s increased this number of sites to six. Um, and then um, with our recent work, we've now got to a position where we've added another three. 
So that's a we've got a 50% increase in the sites for this rare plant. But this feels like a start because it's the next few years that will be critical and applying all the knowledge that we've learned in the process of doing this. And I made this slide of thanks, but actually this reflects how many different people have to be involved to get something like this to work. The mass of landowners, especially Elvedon Estate, you need people who are going to be able to monitor, not just while the introduction is done, but the years to come to understand what is happening with the plant. Um, the strong partnership with Natural England and Forestry England, Norfolk Wildlife Trust, who carry on managing sites, and so on, Heritage Lottery, and so on, and people who take fantastic photos. Um, so it's a combination of, of all that that makes this possible, of which, of course, everyone who belongs to plant life is a part of, because you support it, um, participate, give us ideas, which makes all the difference. Fantastic, thank you, Joe. Uh, that's just superb. Um, I'm, we're, we're really running short of time now. Uh, we have sort of overrun all of us a bit. Um, so we do have some questions. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost Dave, which is a real shame. Quite a few of the questions were, were directed at his talk. Um, uh, one of the questions, I'm going to attempt to answer some of them. Um, how does how do wild boar affect arable plants? Well, uh, I've seen in in France, I've seen wild boar doing wonderful things for arable plants because they turn up in places which aren't normally arable because they respond to the disturbance that wild boar generate. So I, I, I apologize for being excessively brief, but I would say on the whole, quite well, they do okay. Well, um, I'll just I'll put yeah, something ahead. in there that Cersei for the rarer species um they may not be present in the areas where um the rare species are present um and also there tends to, there needs to be some kind of soil seed bed so just chucking pigs anywhere into grassland they no. may, they may not actually disturb the ground where their seed present uh they could of course bring seed in um and, and help and it wasn't pigs it was wild boar oh sorry yes. so yeah there is a difference. Yeah. Uh, part, part of the thing about wild boar is, of course, being wild, they move from place to place and carry things around. Um, one of the ones was, is Westman's wood grazed? Don't know, is the answer, because we haven't got Dave. Which polypody was growing next to the bro area? Don't know, because we haven't got Dave. Um, do all the mosses that fall off the rocks die? Probably, I guess. But there may be more to it. But one of the things we might try and do um, is uh, we'll direct, we'll send these questions to Dave and he might be able to answer them directly afterwards. So there, that's just come up in the chat. Thanks, Becky. Um, but one of the big questions that came up was how do we protect rare and threatened plants from visitors? And Dave showed a fine example of how visitor pressure can affect the things he's interested in. Uh, any views? Uh, you too? Yeah, there's uh, one particular species that we're looking at at the moment, um, broadleaf cudweed, and their visitor pressure uh, can be uh, a benefit and it can also be a uh, difficulty. So uh, there are sites that, um, so it's it grows on spoil heaps and areas like that and in quarries and some of those areas are now on commons or other places with um, visitor access and actually that visitor access has kept the vegetation down these are all bare ground species they need that soil disturbance and the bare ground for the seed to germinate and to have the conditions to grow and develop uh, at some of the sites there is now excessive recreational use uh, that has developed even further over the past couple of years of COVID and that is actually now being detrimental uh, because plants are now being taken up and then of course they can't set seed and that means that the next generation is no longer there to come up because we, with arable plants we're always looking to conserve the soil seed bank yes. that's the thing that we need to replenish. Sure. Yeah I mean in the Brex I think it's similar that um, disturbance 
trampling um, a, quite a lot of plants like to be on compressed ground so such disturbance can be very good but it often needs to be erratic not regular so a, a flush of disturbance really helps so keeping open bare areas but if you remove it the whole time then nothing gets a chance to grow yeah excellent so i mean i, I would sum that up by saying that it's really rather species specific and one of the ways we would come to a judgment about whether visitor pressure needs to be restrained or channeled or controlled is by having a high level of insight into the ecology of the species and i think that's one of the uh, things that goes through all of these talks is the fact that we only get anywhere by really having a detailed insight into the ecology of these things which requires research which is difficult to fund and the only reason we, we can manage to do that is through the support of our supporters the people our members and supporters and all our many partners because all of these projects and, and indeed all the ones i'm involved in are multiple partnerships with a lot of commitment from a lot of different directions i think i probably better need to wind up there because uh, it is very nearly three o'clock which is the time that we we are supposed to end and becky is going to cut us off in our prime if we overshoot so let me say thank you all very much for listening and watching and thanks very much for our speakers for their fantastic talks uh, it's very difficult putting these things together for such, such a short period uh, such a short time to talk uh, and they've they've all been outstanding my view so thank you very much to dave to kath and to joe and to becky for looking off the tech side who you haven't seen she's in the background somewhere um, and thank you all for coming. So we'll call it a day there and good afternoon.